not owned by Metro Parks, it's owned by Casto. Uh, there's an affordable housing component going in starting later this year. Uh, affordable apartments, and we couldn't be more excited about them. In general, people who don't have that easy access to a Metro Park are right out their front door. So that's kind of exciting right here. And then here, and then moving all the way around, way up North Wind Road, is going to be the first step in your next Metro Park. Steve, it's about 50 acres right now. About 50 acres right now. And we're going to talk about some other properties. There's some land owned by AEP. Larry is in constant conversations with AEP. There's some land owned by ODNR. Larry's in constant conservation. <laughs> then there's this little teeny patch of ground that's only about 1,100 acres owned by a major quarrying operation. We got our eyes on all of it. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be a slow process. Exciting. Who remembers Scioto Audubon when it was an impound lot, a warehouse, and inappropriate stuff? Larry, do you remember that? What's that? Scioto Audubon when it wasn't so nice? Yeah, <laughs> does anybody remember Three Creeks when it really wasn't all that nice? You're going to see very similar characteristics as we go today. So any real quick questions on, well, let me tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to hike. There's not a whole lot of up and down. There's one down that we're going to have to go up, back up. But other than that, it's a pretty flat hike. Might be a little wet, might be a little muddy. Uh, staff's been out here and we kind of dried it out. We can thank Dan for drying it out a little bit. Dan, can I tell him, Dan? We pre-hiked it, and Dan broke one of the Metro Parks rules on Wednesday. Walk through a puddle. Dan, Dan, he didn't walk through a puddle, he went swimming. <laughs> <laughs> he like it when I tell him. So, any questions before we get into a time-traveling historic trip? So, where we're standing is on the north end of what was the Hartman Farms. Uh, Dr. Hartman was a renowned physician. Prior to that, I did a little homework on him. He was a farmer that was somewhat successful that then got talked into kind of mentoring under another doctor. I believe he went to Case Western before it was Case Western for med school. Became a doctor, was pretty successful. And then he, he kind of took a disease or an ailment called Kara or Kara, I don't know how to pronounce it. And then he came up with a cure for it. Except he then told everybody every disease was Kara. And he came up with a cure for every disease. So anybody who's a student of history, back then when doctors came up with cures for everything, generally what was that secret ingredient? Okay. Oh, it's close, but, but alcohol. Uh, Dr. Hartman invented this uh, elixir called Peruna. And Peruna, the he had a vision one night when he was sleeping, and an old Indian chief came and visited him in his sleep and gave him the secret recipe. Now what's funny, you do a little bit of homework, that secret recipe seemed to change as people's tastes and desires, you know, ramp up the alcohol, oh wait a minute, alcohol is illegal, ramp down the alcohol. But Peruna was unbelievably successful. It was the number one, uh, there's a, a term for it, not elixir, Patent medicine in the world, the number one. Mr. Hartman was bringing in $100,000 a day in Peruna sales, late 1800s, early 1900s. Not in today's money, back then. He built factories downtown to build it. His office building is still downtown. He built a hotel downtown for people to come stay in the hotel, take a trolley car down High Street, down to Hartman Farms, which is still a little bit of it's there. Google's kind of going in on the site. There's an old farmhouse. There's the old uh, farmhouse over at the quarry site. And you can come down and drink Peruna till your heart's content. He had a 5,000 acre farm where we're standing. At the time, it was the largest farm in the United States of America. It had the largest standing head of cattle anywhere in North America. It is where, who, anybody from Columbus, what's one of our derogatory nicknames? Cowtown. Cowtown. It's where Cowtown came from. All of this is kind of new to me. It's a little bit of internet, a little bit of research. But I guess when Southerners would come up to either work on the farm or to visit Columbus, they noticed all the cows, hence the name Cowtown. So, 
Dr. Hartman's like one of the richest, most unknown people in Columbus history. We all know big names in Columbus history, but they were unbelievably big. And then they started selling land off. We actually bought our piece of land off of the three heirs of Dr. Hartman. Very secretive, quiet family. Not, you don't know, we never met them. But uh, that's kind of exciting. So we already traveled back to, let's say, 1900. That's our first step. But nobody likes standing around listening to Tim. Let's walk. <laughs> if you have questions, I can answer them. Steve's going to kind of be towards the tail. Steve's one of our head designers in this part. He knows a lot. Dan over here to my right knows more about the park than anybody who's here almost on a daily basis. And if you don't ask questions, I get... This has got really hanging. Oh, they got <laughs> University. And they know the mascot? The horse. Guess what the horse's name is? Karuna. Mm -hmm. still that way. Things like Karuna. Obviously, state's property, Metro Parks. Past that gate is owned by Shelly Materials. Shelly Materials is the same quarrying operation that does the quarrying at Quarry Trails. They don't own the land at Quarry Trails, they just lease it. They actually own this land. That's why we're working very closely with them. So we're kind of at a little property. You're going to see it, the quarry. Pretty sure we're going to get to the quarry. But here's our time traveling again. Before Ohio had trains, how did we move stuff around? Boat. What kind of boats? Large. Canal boats. So there was this little old canal called the Ohio to Erie Canal. It started in Portsmouth-ish, ran all the way up to the Cleveland area. There was this little burg known as Columbus. They made it the state capital, but it wasn't part of the Ohio to Erie Canal. A lot of people don't know that. It actually turned down a big Walnut Creek and headed up towards Cleveland, which orphaned Columbus. Well, Columbus couldn't take that, and they said, we're going to build a canal. So they built the Columbus Connector. So right down by uh, uh, the little village of Lockbourne is actually where the Columbus Connector started. Worked its way right up through here, and if you see those taller trees, those taller trees are the Ohio part of the Ohio Erie Canal system. That is the Columbus Connector. Now what's really cool about that 
is one, there's some great history we can talk about it. There's actually still locks down in lock corn that, you know, we're working with them on some interpreters. But it's really straight, really flat. Straight shots of land. So if you jump on that field and walk, you're going to run into Sayota Audubon. So our goal, and I'm looking at Dan, because it'll be Dan doing the work. <laughs> Dan is going to build the trail. Look at that, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> you screw up and go swimming, you got to do it. Dan's going to build the trail from here to Sayota Audubon. I make it sound really easy. It, it's a complicated process. Got a couple big challenges like State Route 104 and all that. But that's another yeah. goal to get us all the way connected. Now the good news is, is we applied for and I've heard we're going to get some attributable funding, some federal funding to build, help us build that bridge across 104. It's going to be a multi-million dollar bridge. But that's the glitch. But Dan's actually really good, Dan and his crew. He can't build this train. Dan can't build bridges yet, right Dan? <laughs> Not very good. Steve, can you design bridges? Oh, Steve can design bridges. Steve does, Steve does designs for Metro Parks. Dan and the rest of the operations team, they're the ones that build the parks. Tim, just a loud mouth does very little. But get in the way, right Dan? <laughs> so, it's back in time, you think about it. This is been part of our history. The Ohio and Erie Canal, what really made Columbus. Now what's also kind of cool is after the canals were gone, the state took possession of the canal land. Well, the state leased this land where you see these poles, and I'll go to the point it changes, to Columbus and Southern Power, AEP, whatever you want to call it. It's one of the lines that feeds downtown Columbus. And we're going to talk a little bit about what happened 18 months ago? Uh, no, months just about ago. a year ago. 12 months ago. Yeah. And if you remember, there were some rolling blackouts in Columbus. Uh, you're going to hear why in a minute. you got to raise your right hand swear after me. We're not going to go expose this anywhere. But we believe, and we're just using logic, what happened. So, AEP controls that land. That's when I said Larry, who's driving around, is working with AEP to get permission to build that trail right underneath these power lines. So, we're now in the 1850s, Ohio to Erie Canal. Can you believe how far we've traveled back? So, is there any canal left? Any what? Canal left? I mean, like... No. And so, they named the camp after it. Had nothing so, to... where is that? Hoover Y Campus. You know where Side of Downs is? go due east about a mile uh, that's another project we're working on this year uh, once again Dan's not doing that work but Steve's gonna be doing that work is that still breaking time? yeah yep I saw a hand go up I'm sorry yes sir this is the tree line of the canal yeah we but pretty certain all right then that that depression the depression on the far side of it would have been the canal, right? I believe that so. That depression? There's, the thing is, you got this massive quarry, and they could have changed the deposit. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that, that hump is very typical of a berm a quarry puts in to keep yes. people from stumbling into the hole. Yes. You go across that berm, you're going down a couple hundred feet. Wow. It's a, you'll see it here in just a few minutes. Big but giant. if uh, that's the tree line, the canal had to either be here, or just past it. Right. I'm thinking the depression is the water and we're on the towpath. Yes. I, and the nice yes. thing is, anybody who can disagree with me is dead. Why? Because you're going to off the wall? No, it would be like 200 years old. Yeah. So, we'll talk about it on the way back. back. We'll tell Wow, that really goes down in there. Yeah. Maybe it's an abandoned quarry. But it doesn't look like I thought I heard him say it was a sinkhole. Yeah. Oh, they've been here with ATVs or something. Looks like a trash over the place. Yeah, somebody oh somebody's always gotta dump their trash. Wow, this is cool. Right. 
done this 854 times this week. And we have, we have not lost anybody no, this I'm, week. She's got it. Can you get down over here too? We're gonna try. <laughs> I mean, gravity will take you down. You know how to walk sideways? I do. Let me show you. sheeting happens. We had an already high Scioto River. Scioto River flows from north to south. Believe it or not, there's a bend in the river up here that the river can actually crest. See the green jacket down there? Double that far and get into here a little bit. The river can also crest and come this way. So on that event, the river actually crested, came this way. You think the beaver might have had a little bit to do with that. Came this way. And kind of that washout there was the retention basin for Lowe's. We believe it failed simultaneously. We have no proof of that. Nobody, nobody was standing up here watching. And then all of this water just was coming in all directions, causing disturbances, causing everything you can catch, and it had to go somewhere. So it was eating away at all of these banks. You're going to see a huge one going up there. I think we're gonna have a quarry view down here. Yeah, this is this is like not Columbus. <laughs> this is not something you see in Columbus. Shows how dangerous water can be. Yeah, water does a lot. And like I was telling the, the girl, I said there's so many veins in this. I mean, so many like little alleys going off of this that are so cool. guy your job is to get rid of a bunch of dirt yeah. to get to the expensive rocks yeah, right. so they spent all this money getting to the expensive rocks and then all of a sudden they had a bunch more dirt sitting on the expensive rocks I mean this is a science project in a spot so it, it got a little tougher what, the only rule I got is you can't go past me from this point so no you're fine <laughs> Kind of hang out, feel around. Don't go past Steve. Steve. Okay. Don't go past that opening. I'm trying to pick around the corner here. You want to go look down in the big hole? Okay, we can use the rope to get back up. You just have to go mock. 
Passing now, congratulations. <laughs> uh, Melissa is right about she's not trespassing. I'm a rule follower. So we are standing on AEP leased land, ODNR owned land. We have an indefinite lease. And then there's water flowing out. Yeah, you see it coming out of the rocks? Yep, that's just groundwater. If you go about 30 feet this way, you're on Shelly Materials land. So when I was talking at the beginning, this park has some elbow room to grow. If they shut those pumps off, and I, I mean, Amy kind of spotted something, and I'm no geologist, hydrologist, but you see groundwater pouring over the edge, the lake would be at least that full if they turned the pumps off. Probably a little more full than that. So, I mean, even look at that little rascal scooter. Yeah. I hope somebody wasn't on it when, yeah. <laughs> when it had let loose, because that was going. I mean, look at the size of trees that are down. Think of, I mean, if you look at the wood line, all of the trees that were standing up there, they're down in the old hole. And I had a couple people on the way down, I pointed out a little patch of gray. You remember that? Yeah. You, you see some of it over there? Yeah. How did they get a concrete truck here? That's concrete washout, right? Wow. <laughs> Come on! Isn't there closet geologists here? I didn't know this. I'm acting smart all of a sudden. <laughs> well, you think about the time. I mean, well, it, know, it's, it's a time glacial. capsule yeah. we're sitting here on. And, and it just, look, I mean, look over there. Now the rust is new. That's the introduction of iron flowing through the water. But you see the real white rock over there? Yeah. That, that wasn't there the other day. That, they set off a charge in there this week. So they knock those edges off, the rock fall down in the hall, they then break up the rocks and then that's what your house is built on or the road you drove here on or whatever. So this hole here is about 600 acres. The tree line over there is the Scioto River. That's and you got another 700 acre hole on the other side. We're, we mean Metro Park staff, are learning the pouring here. <laughs> here and we have photos there was one sitting up there they did they looked like toothpicks when we were flying the drone over that's why we didn't know what they were but uh yeah you mean the yellow yeah yeah that's the equipment so i mean that's just a excavator some bulldozers the drill see the kind of grayish thing yeah that's a It is. What do you say it was? Glacial till. You know, when the glacier churned it up and then just left this as the path of what it left. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's almost like a paste. Yeah, looks like somebody just poured like some it. mortar there or yeah. something. Yeah, like I guess it would be, you know, right? Ground up this rock. Ground up rock, yeah. Moisture. I think Lowe's is missing a cart. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and a scooter Get that and back a bucket. To like yeah, a and a scooter over there.
Oh, he's that way up there. I see some people way up there. Definitely are going up. Um, yeah, there's a more foundation. And some of these look like glacier radish because they look like granite. The weather was pretty marginal for us. Yeah. I mean, we were in the middle of the pandemic, so it was tough to do it. Restaurants were closed. Couldn't get a run of dark. So we were kind of by the transportation. But so here's about as far as, unless you didn't want to get real crazy, I'll hike until midnight. So that looks like rock. That, that little edge? Yeah. That, you know, when water's roaring through there, it's a little cool little waterfall. So see this little thing? This is Tim's theory. That's it. We think. We think that blew out, which then caused an influx of water, which then just caused everything. So if you and if you're free to explore if you want a little bit or go up there, you'll see the huge detention basin that Lowe's has for their stormwater management. Uh, it's it's a very large and deep one. But you know, you, you're very I'm sure they engineered it correctly. Nobody's ever done that. The good news is we're all playing well together. Lowe's, Shelly, Metro Market. Okay, he said that wall over there is actually a retention wall from Lowe's, which is right up there. We have a unique approach to holding We work with them. So we meet you, we get to know your name first. And we talk about you and we find out about what what are your trigger points? What do you, and, and then we activate or enable you to get the resources necessary. It's a slow journey, but it's, uh, and I, Larry just walked up. It's, it's kind of Larry's brainchild. It works. It's just slow. But there's no way to know how many homeless here, just because it does change every day. But uh, what's it? I can't think of his name. Ranger down here. people moving in. We want to work with you here already. Uh, I'm not forgetting about general conditions of the site. Yeah, it's closed. This is not a, oh, I should have done that at the beginning. <laughs> this is not a park. You are not, not part of a secret group that can come down here and lead hikes on the weekends. <laughs> or you will meet Stefan. <laughs> Yeah, and if the worst thing you can say is, Tim told me I was allowed. <laughs> that is guaranteed red flag. Uh, but no, it, we're I mean, we are working here today, not literally today, but we've done some invasive removal, we've done some cleanups. Uh, there's a big field up behind the shopping center <laughs> that we spent a lot of time working on. Uh, 
Larry and I had a disagreement about which end's going to open first, and I think Larry's wisdom is going to shine through. North, look at all this. He loves it when I say this. The north end will probably be what opens first, uh, begrudgingly, I have to admit it. Uh, but then it'll, it'll just slowly evolve. And uh, hopefully you guys will be part of all of it. And, and you'll get to tell the story in years. Oh my God, we were there and there were shopping carts. There was this, there was that. And now look at it. I'll tell another story. Larry, you probably remember the phone call I made to you about 15 years ago. Much like Larry, Melissa does all yeah. the heavy lifting yeah. around the tribe. But we get a lot of questions, and we love answering the questions. What we don't like are the people who know what we're doing that have no clue what we're doing. Is that a good way to describe it? Uh, it really. And Amy's, no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. Amy, Amy's got to jump in, but it really is. If you so, it kind of started as a as a, a group project three, four, five years ago. And early on in the group projects, one of the group identified that about 90% of the land along our rivers in central Ohio, the big five, are some way, shape, or form publicly owned. And as a kid that grew up in Columbus, a kid that has been in every creek, river, stream, to me it's like, yeah, they've always been there. But they really aren't. Because unless there's a sign that says welcome, unless there's a... A, a, a clean place to be, a safe place to be, they're really underutilized assets. And when I say underutilized, and this is where Amy can jump in, underutilized means a place that you can catch crawdads, a place that you can just sit and reflect, a trail, a restroom, uh, something cool to do. That's rapid five. And then you see some of the visioning with hot air balloons and zip lines. And, yeah, it's visioning stuff. And that's kind of where this little conundrum has, has happened. Some but, people daydream pretty. Yeah. Cool. Pretty big. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think if you have an and, and this is part of our healing. So we'll just say that. But um, I, I saw the book. Um, somebody showed it to me. I was talking. I, I still work a lot advising governor, president, others. And this concept of one health, um, G7 concept about human health, uh, animal health and the environment are all one thing. Um, it was actually the old D. Larry King of the Oshu of Vet School who coined that term, and now it's it's been around since the 60s. But of course, all these things are related. It almost <laughs> seems like no kidding. But we're rediscovering that with things like zoonotic diseases and how the environment affects our health and, that, and vice versa. So I said something about caring about that, and someone showed me a book. I went to a meeting thinking I would volunteer to do the health and wellness aspect Big of mistake. it. Big <laughs> mistake. <laughs> Somebody donated money and just said, hey, let's start a nonprofit to look at that. And that's all we are right now. We're beginning to explore. There were um, five design firms that looked at our waterways. They looked at systems all over the world. These giant park systems. Um, LA right now, if you don't know, is doing 51 miles of the LA River, which is basically a concrete data you know, the cars go in and movies and all that. <laughs> but they're actually be doing the whole thing similarly, layering arts and history and culture all throughout it. What I loved about this dream um, isn't any one of the visions because 80 jurisdictions are now rolling. We're not actually doing any of it. 80 jurisdictions wow. are trying to design what they want, but they just want to make sure they connect to each other. And that we have east-west connections in our city for bikes, for rapid transit. But it's about human health and well-being, and it's about putting nature at everyone's doorstep. So it's every neighborhood. That's 
you know, we're working a lot right now in Linden, we're working in Whitehall, looking at opportunities for outdoor classrooms to whole new walkways. And so it's, it's really, we know the nice areas of town are gonna have access, but not everyone would. So it's really a big public health project. Nobody knows that, but it's part of what I've always done. I was doing youth homelessness and working at the Columbus Foundation when the governor discovered me. I didn't know him. Somebody saw the work I was doing. So to me, it's all the same thing I've always done. But um, Melissa, I don't know if you have any other thoughts. Sure, sure. Thank you. And thank you, Tim, and to your team yeah, for having Melissa, us be out here today and all of you. Yeah. Um, I'll say what brought me to the project, too, is public health. That's my background. Um, I tell everyone that it's public health disguised as a first project. Right? <laughs> it's the way that we can get social determinants, right? Taking care of housing and education and all those things that we know that impact health. I think the beauty of this project here, Great Southern, is actually we're in one of the most underserved areas of Columbus. Um, and we know that nature heals. And so it makes me emotional even talking about it. But just, you know, knowing that we can bring um, something to the people of this, of this area that brings joy and recreation and economic development, environmental stewardship, all the pillars and the values that we believe in in Rapid 5 all wrapped up right here in this project. So thank you for allowing us to be here for the sneak peek. And I have a question for you. And Keith Myers, um, he was a gentleman who, he, he started MKSK, a landscape design firm. He's sort of like a Frederick Law Olmsted of our area. He. Um, he went to John Wolf, back, uh, talked him into removing the dams out of downtown to restore the river back to its flow. Everyone thought the downtown would flood, the bridges would collapse. Um, they had to figure out things like how to hand carry, like one EPA agent and six volunteers, maybe some of you helped, hand carrying muscles to do that. And um, he's, he's responsible a lot for what's happened around OSU as well, trying to restore that. Um, but they, it was it was during the pandemic they got together with all these young people and said imagine what could be possible and that's what the book was that I saw and you can still find